Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Tuesday the 12th of October 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we finish Chapter 7, The Communist Production, and read Chapter 8, The Socially Average Working Hour, as the basis of production. This week I have the new patron Matt to thank. If you like extra bonus episodes, creating Discord over in the Discord server, joining in the Patreon reading groups, or just want to support the good work, why not head on over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. This week we'll be releasing a Patreon-only episode on capitalist procurement theory, the flaws of standard economic understanding on how demand and supply affect prices, and what allocation, or the lack of it, under capitalism can teach us when we think about planning a communist society, all with the main man himself, Emmanuel, a real-life procurement guru and stalwart of the TSSI series. Okay, enough of that. Let's join the discussion. Hello and welcome to the eighth reading group of the Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution. Today we're trying to finish chapter seven, that's right, and see how far we get into chapter Eight. Now we're going. We're on section E, the reproduction of labour power. Section E, reproduction of labour power. Nevertheless, it is necessary to consider individual consumption for a moment. It is true that in our example there are six hundred and fifty million available for this purpose, but that does not say how the product is distributed among the workers. For example, unskilled, learned, and intellectual work may be evaluated differently. The distribution could be, for example that the unskilled person is paid three quarters hours for an hour worked, the learned person just one hour, the civil servant one and a half hours, and the manager three hours. A 40 hour week is recorded in the company books, 30 hours for unskilled workers, 40 hours for skilled workers, 60 hours for civil servants, and 120 hours for managers. In fact, economists take this view. It does not occur to them to value the work equally, i.e. to give everyone the same share of the social product. That is the meaning of Neurath's life circumstances. The nutrition psychologists will determine a subsistence minimum that the income of the unskilled represents, while the others receive more according to the ratio of their diligence, their abilities, and the importance of their work. Kautsky considered this difference in remuneration to be necessary because he believes that higher wages should be paid for unpleasant or heavy work than for pleasant and light work. He also believes that this is a reason why the calculation of working hours is not practicable. With his colleague Leichter, he goes so far as to maintain the wage difference even within a profession, because the individual wages would have to rise with the routine of the skilled worker over the basic wage. Thus they stand, for example, on the position of the retention of the piecework in communism. Leichter, on the other hand, rightly notes that this is not an obstacle to the calculation of working hours, as we can see from our example. He says, all that remains is the purely technical difficulty, also present in capitalism, of setting the wages for the individual jobs. But that does not mean any complication in comparison with the capitalist method. So we note that of this kind of communists, the different payment of the different kinds of work, even if the individual differences within the same kind of work, is in principle considered right. But this means nothing other than that even in communism, the struggle for better working conditions does not stop, that the distribution of the social product of production has an antagonistic character, and that the struggle for the distribution of the product is continued. This struggle is and will be a struggle for power. Surely it cannot be demonstrated more clearly that these gentlemen cannot imagine a society in which the working class is not dominated. For them, people have simply become objects. People are nothing more than part of the production apparatus, for which nutrition physiologists have to calculate how much food has to be supplied to this material, subsistence minimum, to have new labour force available. The working class must fight with the greatest energy against such a view and demand the same share of social wealth for all. So any, any comments here? Anybody have any comments? This gets to one of the big questions that we constantly come up with with respect to this book. Should we have differential pays? And it kind of makes a kind of a core critique of the idea of differential pay 
that it reintroduces the basically the class power. It says it explicitly here. But this means nothing other than even in communism, the struggle for better working conditions does not stop, that the distribution of the social product of production has an antagonistic character and that the struggle for the distribution of the product is continued. This struggle is and will be a struggle for power. Because this is a pretty pivotal, a pivotal part of the argument is for basically, you know, that idea of one hour's work, one hour's labour. Anybody have anything to say? This should be controversial. Yeah, no, I was rereading uh, Critique of the uh, Gotha programme where Marx talks about, uh, touches on this. And it seems to be like his attitude is, yeah, you know, there's, there is a sense of unfairness that, you know, people who work twice as hard will, you know, won't get paid twice as much and people with six kids will still get paid the same as people with one. And so what? Seems to be his, his attitude. And I, I would agree with him and, you know, with the GIC. You know, so everything else is just going to essentially create classes. Yeah, it's it's just like if you have differential pay as a core component of your class of your system, you have a class society, and yeah. uh, it's as simple as that. You know, Cockshot, Paul Cockshot was actually be claiming that in that passage, Mark was making an argument for differential pay, which is kind of it's confusing. And I thought that on first reading, I don't think it is. He's criticising the Gotha programme for saying this is equal rights. He's saying they're not equal rights. But yes, he's not saying it should be unequal pay. Absolutely. And so one thing that people have uh, that constantly bring up about this section here is this idea, uh, the, the problem of, say, we've just had the revolution, you know, on Monday. On Tuesday, all our doctors, you know, flee to, I don't know, Spain or wherever the hell it would be closest, Right. And we have a shortage of skills. Now, I, I could see a case where in the, po- in the post-revolution for very, very specialist skills where like until post-revolution, you have trained up your people in sufficient quantities that you might be stuck importing uh, skills from outside or capitalism or even within internal people that you have to overpay in the very, very short term, like four or five years until they're people are able to run the stuff themselves. You know, I, I can imagine that has been a, a practical thing. Uh, what do people think about that? Yeah, so I think that that's like a, a huge, important question for a lot of this. I know, but I think that one of the things that it also kind of papers over is the way that reintroducing those kinds of, you know, pay differentials can end up having a really, really traumatic and deleterious effect on the revolutionary project as a whole. That's something I know that gets brought up in like Brinton's Bolsheviks and Workers Control and um, several of the books that I've read kind of about revolutionary Spain, where they, they talk about like, you know, a, as the revolutionary tide began to turn back and as the price differentials became reinstituted, all of a sudden, you know, the, the enthusiasm for the revolution, for the revolutionary process starts to abate. People are like, you know, I, I'm, you know, combusting my ass <laughs> for for all of this and I've got a boss again and I've got, you know, I'm dealing with the same kind of managerial crap that I was dealing with before. And so I think that really kind of underscores the importance of like during the revolutionary process, we need to be like the revolution needs people to be training each other in the things that we do. I think one of the core aspects of the GIK and a lot of like the the kind of of council communist critique of capitalism really comes from that division of labor problem. And like, of course we can't go back to like a, a pure no division of labor, but like, If we're not trying to solve those problems, we're not trying to create ways of sharing those skills and creating the the ability for, you know, that expertise to be diffused throughout the the population. I think that you you run into this this problem really specifically. Yeah, I think any any revolutionary movement that's like serious prior to it would have to essentially, you know, look at what are the key personnel do we have enough people trained up for them you could even train them prior to it you know what i mean like you could imagine you could train up people to be like emergency medics or doctors or specialists like that outside of the actual bourgeois system and have your own party actually accreditations even if they're not recognized under capitalism i I think like that would be something that could highly be necessary and also to the point of reintroducing the class stuff with the differential wages like you, you see, like, um, what is that system in Spain, the cooperative system? Yeah, Mondragon, like, they have di- differential wages. And while it's probably better to work there than under a capitalist 
one, I don't think that it's a uh, kind of revolutionary uh, inducing uh, stuff. Okay, next up was Will. Yeah, I just wanted to note that regardless of your preference, like I, I agree that we should be aiming for you know equal share of the social product, but they do point out that even if you didn't have that, their system of labor time accounting would work fine. You know, you could just change how the numbers work and it, like, you know, so if there are necessary concessions to circumstance, it would handle it fine. And you don't need to kind of sacrifice the labor time accounting regardless. But I'll read out Max's point here. He says, I, um, I don't have a moral concern with equal pay, but I am concerned with how people will be trained to fulfill skilled labor positions. If people were paid for the hours of education necessary to perform specialized roles, since they are not directly participating in commodity production, that would throw off equilibrium between production and consumption. I, I think more than likely, I think the easiest way to deal with training of people, like say, if you want to go to train to be a doctor, for example, like that students, you know, going into skilled learning positions could be paid from the general taxation pool, a stipend or whatever, until such time as they're fully trained up and then they go into productive work where they get a uh, labor. So I don't think that would be too much of a problem. You could also, for if society could, if they wanted to just term actual training as the equivalent as productive or, or the GSU units, that's also a possibility. I think, think those things are in the fine detail. One thing as well here that people haven't mentioned so far, which I'm kind of surprised is the idea of say types of labor where people, no one wants to do it, you know, getting rid of fatbergs in the sewers or, you know, working in the sewage plant or, you know, quite dangerous work. And I, I think the uh, paracon, the participatory economic approach of job complexes is certainly the way I would think uh, is the correct way to go about, it. you know, I think you could end up with just weird other kind of classes forming if like bin men get twice the wages of everybody else. You know, I think you just change the focus of the class system. Alex would like to comment. Yeah, on that point uh, about bin men, I mean, you know, weirdly in capitalist society, people get paid like inversely to the well, when it comes to, so when it comes to health, from most important to least, it's you know probably sewage bin men, nurses, doctors, surgeons, and obviously they get paid in, in reverse order. I I, th I think for difficult and unpleasant work, I think it, it has to be a moral thing. It has to be celebrated that, you know, it's like, you know, that guy's a, 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 a bin man. God, he makes a huge difference to our lives. That guy, you know, cleans fatbergs, you know. Uh, I, I would hope that's something that, that could encourage people to do those jobs. But I, I don't think paying extra is the way to go. Yeah, and, like, people are kind of weirdos as well. Like, some people, like, just like dangerous jobs, you know. There's guys that do scaffolding, you know. Yeah. And they love it, you know. So there's an element of like, I think a lot of people are kind of psychopaths. They like kind of crazy shit. <laughs> so I'm just laughing at Kilter's uh, clapping for Bin Man. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the comment. If it was, yeah, Kilter says, uh, we can solve this by clapping for the Bin Man. I, I think so. I think that's certainly worked here in the in the NHS here. They got their 1% pay rise, all they were looking for. Okay, Mac. Uh, yeah, not, not to overly belay the point but i think that like what what the clapping for bin men idea kind of kind of gets to is that you know under under this kind of a system there would have to be like a different relationship to work right like that the as long as and like i, I think that that's something that like you know marx even talks about is that like you know you know you, you're the way that you engage with productive labor the way that you engage with socially necessary labor is going to have to change in a way where you know that kind of really, really unpleasant work is going to have to take on a more social characteristic because if it doesn't, it doesn't get done. And if it doesn't get done, you know, society isn't able to, to reproduce itself. And so I think that's where when you reduce it down to like a strict division between the economic in terms of like production and consumption and the political in terms of decision making, maintaining that that distinction kind of creates a world in which it's easier for people to be like, ah, you know, that's not my problem. That's, you know, that's the, that's the, the garbage man's job. That's the, the doctor's job. That's the, the janitor's job, whatever. But when that economic sphere and that political sphere are wedded together under the kind of council system that they're kind of proposing here, I think the idea is those kinds of jobs take on a different, a, a fundamentally different relationship to the people who have to do them and to the communities that are responsible for taking care of them. Yeah, absolutely. 
totally agree. Uh, Alex, do you, do you want to take uh, section F then? Yeah, sure thing. Section F, the value of labor force in, in life circumstances communism. The reason why the communist economists cannot get rid of the, the difference in the valuation of labor is we think their class feeling. An equal distribution of the social product completely contradicts this powerful bastion of conceptualization and therefore seems impossible to them. However, if not an old principle, it is certainly a correct one, but the world of thought is mainly guided by the world of emotions and that the mind will not find much else than that which corresponds to the world of emotions. From this, it can be explained that, e.g. Leichter, wants to abolish the concept of value for objective production, but cannot free himself from it concerning the labour force. The difference in the appreciation of the different types of labour force in capitalism is because the labour force is a commodity that can be bought just like other commodities. The average price the entrepreneur pays for it is as high as it is necessary to reproduce the labour force. For the unskilled worker, the value is as high as the food cost for the lowest existence minimum. The children of the unskilled generally cannot learn a profession because they have to earn as much as possible immediately. Thus, the unskilled have themselves reproduced the unskilled labour force again. More is needed to reproduce the skilled labour. Here the children learn a profession and thus the learned have reproduced the learned labour force themselves. The same applies to intellectuals. For Leichter, this commodity character of the labour force also applies to socialism. He says, Differently qualified workers, port workers, civil servants, engineers, need a different amount of effort to reproduce their labor force. Qualified workers need more to reproduce their labor force for the next day, for the next year, i.e. their current expenses are greater. However, more effort is needed to rebuild a qualified labor force as a whole, i.e. a person with the same level of education and knowledge, if the former carrier of this labor force is no longer able to work. All this must be included in the various assessments of the labor force. G, the value of labor in capitalism according to Marx. If we look here at the Marxist analysis of the value of the labor force, it is perfectly clear that the wage laws for capitalism and life circumstances of communism are completely identical. Marx says, what then is the cost of production of labor power? It is the cost required for the maintenance of the labor as a laborer and for his education and training as a laborer. Therefore, the shorter the time required for training up to a particular source of work, the smaller is the cost of production of the worker. The lower is the price of his labor power, his wages. In those branches of industry in which hardly any period of apprenticeship is necessary and the mere bodily existence of the worker is sufficient, the cost of his production is limited almost exclusively to the commodities necessary for keeping him in working condition. The price of his work will therefore be determined by the price of the necessary means of subsistence. Here, however, there enters another consideration. The manufacturer who calculates his cost of production and, in accordance with it, the price of the product, takes into account the wear and tear of the instrument of labour. If a machine costs him, for example, 1,000 shillings, and this machine is used up in 10 years, he adds 100 shillings annually to the price of the commodities in order to be able, after 10 years, to replace the worn-out machine with a new one. In the same manner, the cost of production of simple labour power must include the cost of propagation, by means of which the race of workers is enabled to multiply itself and to replace worn-out workers with new ones. The wear and tear of the worker, therefore, is calculated in the same manner as the wear and tear of the machine. Thus, the cost of production of simple labour power amounts to the cost of the existence and propagation of the worker. The price of this cost of existence and propagation can constitute wages. The wages thus determined are called the minimum of wages. Just as the reproduction of the objective part of the production apparatus is an individual function of the capitalist, so the reproduction of the labor force is an individual function of the worker. But just as the reproduction of the objective part of the production apparatus becomes a social function in communism, so also the reproduction of the labor force becomes a social function. It is no longer imposed on different individuals, but carried by society. Teaching is no longer that tied to Papa's wallet, but depends solely on the child's disposition and physical condition. 
It cannot be the idea of communism to give individuals who are endowed by nature with more favourable hereditary factors or more favourable abilities and thus have the possibility to enjoy to the fullest extent all achievements of human society in the field of culture, art and science. On top of that, even a larger share of the social product than those that are less fortunate physically or psychologically by nature. But there is more. The distribution of the social product in communism is not a simple reproduction of labour force. It is the distribution of all material and intellectual riches that humanity produces with its technology, and thus goes far beyond the simple reproduction of labour force. What communists, Alakowski, like the Neurath, want with their life circumstances, amounts to ensuring the lower worker a subsistence minimum based on nutrition physiology, while the higher consume abundance. That is to say, in reality, they do not think of abolishing exploitation. Based on the common possession of means of production, the exploitation is continued. In the life circumstances communism, the producers give their labour force to a great, indefinable something, which is euphemistically called society. But where this something appears, it is an element alien to the producers that rises above them, exploits them and rules over them as something that is the actual ruler of the production apparatus, as a community in which they are included as objects of production factors. Hell yeah. That's a, it's a big long section there, but I thought it, it's just a logical unit to read together. Basically, they're making the case, and I think it's crystal clear, that this idea of differential pay it, it maintains essentially the wage form. It maintains the class dynamics whereby those that are, are unskilled don't get the same chances as those that are skilled workers don't get the same pay. They reproduce themselves in this unskilled thing, and you just inevitably have classes. You know, it's it's kind of like a, just a, a class society, just a different class society. So, like, there's a there's a there's a really nice little bit here, I think. But just as the reproduction of the objective part of the production apparatus becomes a social function in communism, so also the reproduction of the labor force becomes a social function. Okay, what is he saying there? He's saying like now that society owns all the all of the machinery, the means of production socially, okay, uh, the reproduction of the labor force is a social function. So it's not like an individual function, like under capitalism, the individual capitalist reproduces his productive system and the individual function of the worker to reproduce himself. Under communism, we have the means of production are owned communally, and therefore the, the reproduction of the labor force should be a communal function. So this is getting away from this distinction between skilled and unskilled labor. Any comments here now? Or do we have no uh, argument with any of these things? I think everyone's yeah, wholeheartedly agreeing with us, Victor. Yeah, that's good, because I thought we'd have more... Um, like, it is the kind of thing that comes up with people. It's particularly a kind of a transition period. You know, like it was one of the things that, like, you know, the Soviet Soviet experiments that the kind of really... And the Chinese, you know, all of the the twentieth century experiments—they really kind of, you know, it, it's what caused them to flounder. I think. Surely, okay, the, the first few years are going to be different. Surely, I mean, you, when you just have a, had a revolution, I can imagine, you know, different rules could apply. I mean, I, yeah. I think you know, very early, like eight, 19, 18, 19, I think Lenin suggested that you know technical experts either did their job enthusiastically or at the point of the gun. But I don't think that worked very well. I'm sorry, they ended up, you know, paying the more continuing uh, a lot of the, the previous structure. Personally, I think, you know, the proles are way more skilled now. You know, I think that uh, most of the managerial function is in man, man management and finance is where a lot of the actual expertise of, of management is now. That, like, we have a, uh, in, in the West, we have developed industrial systems and we have a proletariat that has high levels of skills like the amount of proletarians that would do worse under a non-exploitative wage under capitalism, I think is very small. I think it's vanishingly small, if at all. I think that it's less of an issue. Mac, do you want to do you want to speak? Sure. Yeah. So basically, and and I could be wrong. I'm not. I'm by no means an expert on the GIK specifically, but I also like what well, you know. With a lot of the debates that have kind of happened is in response to this book, you know, in terms of of like you know whether or not the their solution for doing this is the one that people want to move forward with is kind of like the the question of is is this council system part of the transition like you know is is this like in in like the marxist breakdown of 
you know, dictatorship of the proletariat versus lower phase communism versus higher phase communism is this, like the, a lot of the council communists kind of saw the council system as being the expression of the dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, all the proletariat comes together and has the power there. And so the, their critique of a lot of like the Leninist and specifically Soviet implementation of socialist in quotes to them policy was that they never even got to the transitionary period. They just stayed capitalist. And that's where you get like Rula and some of the other councilists who were just like, yeah, this is this is just like the bourgeois revolution, you know, but with a bourgeoisie who is too weak to do it, not a socialist revolution at all. And so I think that like when having the conversation about like, is this is this putting the cart before the horse? Is this, you know, us trying to do stuff that we should be doing in, you know, a later developmental stage during the transitionary period? I think that for a lot of these people, the way that they would define this system was we haven't gotten into the, you know, from each to each desired mode yet. This is our way of getting us there. And so I think that, um, you know, oftentimes I feel like we throw around the term like transitionary period referring to it from like a very kind of Lenin centric or Soviet centric mode. And, and I think that this is a, when, when engaging with the council communists uh, specifically, it's helpful to understand that like to them, this was the transitionary period. This was the proletariat, not necessarily even fully, like fully developed communism, lower phase or, or higher phase. Uh, but I, I could be wrong about that. That's just kind of my understanding based off the reading that I've done. Yeah, look, I, I think I would push back a, a tiny bit on you there, Mac, because I, I would think that the, I would say the process of implementing, of getting towards uh, labor time accounting is dictatorship of the proletariat, like the actual instituting the, the rules of, of this system is the, is the time when the proles are saying, we're doing this, we're taking this, we're, we're taking over the control of society from the bourgeoisie. But I think also like the, the implementation of labor time accounting is is the lowest stage, if you want to call it, of communism. It is communism, the labor time planning. It's not a transition. It's like there is a, a process whereby the implementation of this labor time accounting is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And when it's bedded in the lower stage of communism until the productivity is so high, essentially, that its uh, work becomes uh, a pleasure and not a joy and you've higher stage and it's based on need. That's my understanding of what, what they're saying in the book. Kielcher. I, I thought that the, the section made the really good point that a lot of jobs, you get paid less, even though it's a more important job, and or we've discussed this anyway, and, and, and vice versa, the jobs that people would like to do, you get paid a lot of money for with capitalism. But what we've talked around a little bit, and we've, we've said that, you know, just like sort of socially validating the importance of jobs is enough to get people to do them. But I can't see it completely replacing the fact that some jobs are going to be really popular and some jobs are going to be really unpopular. And I'm, I'm curious to see if the book addresses that at any point. I don't know, but say everyone wants to be a hairdresser and no one wants to be the bin man. It feels like, you know, an obvious, uh, an obvious sort of thing that's going to come up. So who controls who gets to do what? Yeah. Like that's not dealt in this book, but I honestly, I think the kind of participatory economic approach is where it's like, you know, society comes up with like what are shitty and nice jobs and people get a percentage of each that they have to perform and they can choose whichever it is they have to perform like in my neighborhood it might be that maybe one month of the year you've got to do the bins or you've got to help out with the sewage or something or in your internal job like the hospital you're a doctor but you also have to deal with medical waste for a certain number of hours you know working in old folks home helping people with alzheimer's or something that somebody mightn't like you know, like there's lots of, I think, scope there for, they call it job complexes. I think that's typically the way to, to, to go. I think that, I think it's only the really unpleasant jobs that will probably end up there. I think more fundamentally that the, the kind of the role jobs that you don't like doing in, in a workplace should also, but that's, it's actually nearly more important for that stuff. Because, you know, if in the weeds there are problems with sourcing people for the highly, highly horrible jobs, society might decide to, say, offer double pay for something like just just the worst ones. I could imagine that may end up being a, a thing that is done. But, like, certainly it's more about the everyday, all of the type of work that people do. Let me bring in Chris then. My assumption is just that a, a lot of these menial tasks will just sort of flow up to who are sort of the uh, administrators and professionals in society today, like a lot of, you know, hospital chores, you know, I, I just would assume that physician nurses and 
whoever would be responsible for that. Like anyone's responsible for the chores in their own home today, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it seems the, natural to me. <laughs> it does seem natural, yeah. But like you know, you can imagine there is other jobs that are just so undesirable. But like honestly, I think it, like a lot of that could be done to a certain extent through like because society nobody wants to do these goddamn jobs. We'll find ways of doing them that are a lot more efficient, you know, and not labor well, dependent. So I, I just want to bring in one like so you consider night work, right? In some industries, it's kind of necessary. Like you can't really run a steel, you can't shut a steel mill down every single day. You know, it has to keep running for a protracted period of time. So obviously there are things that, you know, we just can't get around. And I think that would have to be sort of dispersed, you know, as part of a social chore or whatever. But definitely I just uh, segregating people by their skills is something that should definitely be avoided. I, I don't know if anyone else wants to develop that, but uh, that, that's just the point I wanted to make. I think it seems like everybody's pretty much on the same plan here. I thought there'd be more pushback on this stuff because this is the stuff that people tend to give pushback about the book on. So, uh, or about, <laughs> this is what, like, no joking, this is kind of like what a lot of uh, kind of, let's be honest, Marxists, Leninists, and uh, ML types give a lot of pushback on because it's the opposite of what was implemented under the kind of the Soviet experiments that a lot of those people are fans of. So this kind of goes flying in the face of that logic. But, you know, I think if you're a communist, like differential wages under communism, it's a contradiction in terms. OK, I think everybody's pretty, pretty on board with this. This is good. Very good. I'm happy. OK, let's try on to chapter eight. Who wants to put up their hand to do a bit of reading here? Chris. We have previously pointed out, see chapter 4c, that Max Weber and Ludwig Mises were able to reap their laurels by defeating the working time calculation, and how Kautsky proved to be a very clever student. In his book, The Proletarische Revolution und ihr Programm, he gives proof of this. But with that, he comes to the difficulty that he must now turn against Marx. In his usual loyalty, he does not, of course, do this, but declares the calculation of working hours theoretically conceivable, but unsuitable for practical implementation. Before he begins to explain these considerations, he first gives a formulation of the working time calculation. Still, it should be noted that he accidentally forgets to mention that this was Marx's point of view. Kautsky first shows the impossibility of production without a unit of account and concludes that the continuity of money is indispensable as a measure of value for accounting and the calculation of exchange ratios in a socialist society. But then he asks, but will it require the same money that still exists today or that should exist after all? The money that is formed from a special commodity, usually gold. Instead of this product and representatives of human labor, could one not directly define human labor itself as a measure of value and create labor money that directly certifies work done? This would be conceivable, for example, in the form that every worker receives a certificate for every working hour he has completed. For this certificate, he receives the right to the product of one working hour. For each product, the amount of work it costs would have to be calculated in this way. For the wage of one working day, the worker could always buy products whose manufacture took one working day. The calculation would always have to be correct. Any exploitation would be impossible, and the worker would have complete freedom in how he wanted to invest his wages. Any paternalism by an authority that allocates rations to the individual would be avoided. There is no doubt that such kind of money would be conceivable but could it also be done in practice? Oh no, too bad it's not possible. And why is that not possible? Because Kautsky believes that wage and accord differences prevent this, and because he still regards communism as the monster cartel of Hilferding, in which the production managers control the entire economy from their central government offices. In this way, he reaches a completely wrong conclusion. His question has the following character. With the abolition of private property, 
The entire social economic life is united into one unit. The products move from one company to another until the end product is suitable for consumption. The whole world is involved in the transfer of semi-finished products and raw materials. Thousands and thousands of workers provided their labor force before, for example, a pair of shoes was ready for consumption before they appeared as finished products. How many working hours does this end product contain? That's the formulation of Kautsky's riddle, and he desperately lets his head sink in such an inhuman task. Yes, theoretically, of course, the solution must be possible, but practical? No, it is impossible. Quote, to calculate for each product the amount of work it has cost from its first beginnings and its completion, including transport and other auxiliary works. The estimation of the goods according to work contained in them, even the most tremendous and perfect statistical apparatus cannot achieve." End quote. Indeed, Kautsky is absolutely right that in this way it is impossible. However, such a method of production calculation exists only in Kautsky's imagination. R.I.P. Kautsky. Yeah. Rip. Rip. So he, he's going in on him hard here. Kautsky basically, well, we're going to continue in the next section, you know, as he starts to further get confused. But uh, essentially, Kautsky took on Weber's and Mises, von Mises' critique and basically says the idea that the cartel could calculate all the labor accurately that's gone into this product would be impossible because you have all these secondary products or initial products and intermediary products and the calculation just gets so incredibly overwhelming that you know no cartel could price these accurately and if you can't price them accurately then you're going to end up with problems about how do you pay people for what they've done properly uh, and so the whole thing just collapses in a heap a any comments on this section before we go on to uh, like there's answer okay chris i think we'll we'll keep going b leichter's answer even if Leister fully agrees with Kautsky that a society without exploitation belongs to the fantasies of the millennial kingdom, he knows much better than his great party colleague how the calculations in production work. He emphasizes that within a trust or cartel, goods are never transferred without settlement, and that this will also be the case in communism. Quote, there are relations between the individual production sites and this relationship will continue to exist in the world as long as there is a division of labor. And the division of labor in this higher sense will continue to develop with the progress of technology. All material conditions of production, all semi-finished materials, all raw materials, all auxiliary materials, which are delivered from other production sites to the processing plant, will be debited, invoiced to it. The cartel magnates, or in a socialist economy, the leaders of the entire economy, will not have different companies produced with the same program according to different methods and with different costs. This is also often an incentive for weak entrepreneurs to let themselves be swallowed by a giant corporation in capitalism, nolens volens, since they hope that now also for their business, the most appropriate organization within the cartel, the best manufacturing method, the most capable office employees will be used to increase the productivity of their business. For this, however, it is necessary to record the results of all operations separately and to do so no matter whether in capitalist or socialist economy, as if each operation had its own entrepreneur who wants to become clear about the economic result of production. Therefore, there is very strict accounting within the cartel, and it belongs to the amateurish idea of capitalism and also of socialism if one thinks that within the cartel, goods can be moved without further accounting. In short, that the individual group operations do not know very well how to differentiate between mine and yours." End quote. There is thus a settlement between the different operations. Even within each individual operation, the books are kept according to the latest and most accurate methods. 
For reasons that cannot be examined here in more detail, capitalist management was forced to switch to rationalization around 1921 and around 1922, a completely new literature was produced which developed the methods of calculating the exact cost price for each individual method, for each individual partial work. This is composed of many factors as consumption of means of production, raw and auxiliary materials, a certain standard for social insurance, as well as for the office staff, etc. General formulas can, therefore, be used to calculate the production costs for each individual item, Leister explains. Capitalist accounting, when carried out perfectly and smoothly in a factory, can at any time accurately determine the value of a semi-finished product, a piece of work. In production, the costs of each individual operation. It can determine in which of several workshops of a factory, on which of several machines, with which of several workers, a work ration is cheaper. It can thus at any time increase the rationality of the production process to the highest level. Besides, there is another achievement of the capitalist accounting method. In every large factory, there are several expenses and expenditures that are not directly included in the exchangeable end product. This refers to salaries of office employees, heating of localities, etc. GIC. It is also one of the great achievements of the capitalist accounting method to have made possible these subtleties in the economic accounts, end quote. However, the formulas as they are currently used in a certain enterprise are not suitable in communism because various factors that are now included in the cost accounting, such as interest on capital, do not apply to us and because they are based on the common denominator of money. Still, the method as such is a lasting advance. Also, in this respect, the new society is born from the womb of the old one. Okay, so Leiter is getting to the correct insight that, you know, you don't need to worry about, everybody doesn't need to worry about everybody else's stuff. You only need to worry about your own individual accounting. So he says here, like... Um, Therefore, there's very strict accounting within the cartel, and it belongs to the amateurish idea of capitalism and also socialism, if one thinks that within the cartel, goods can be moved without further accounting. In short, that the individual group operations do not know very well how to differentiate between mine and yours. So this is going to be the kind of key core insight that uh, Leiter is going to get to with respect to how you know individual, say, workers' councils could calculate correctly and exactly using the formula that we've already seen from last week, the F plus C plus L in the English version of it, the fixed and circulating inputs and uh, labor time. Does anybody know, I'm wondering if Herman, maybe you knew about what it was he's talking about here when he says that capitalist management was forced to switch to rationalization around 1921. And by 2022, a completely new literature was produced, which developed the methods for calculating the exact cost price for each individual method, for each individual partial work. I was wondering if anybody had any ins insight into that. I would have thought that the accounting stuff by capitalism would have been pretty much in place before that to be able to calculate profit and loss. Any other comments in this section by anybody? Nolan's Volans, and people didn't know what that meant, that meant whether they want to or not. Anybody have a hands up or will we move on to the next section? I think we've kind of hit this stuff in previous chapters, but he's built, he's going to trying to build up to this case of doing our guild calculation. Alex. Just in case you think everyone's totally good. I'm not totally good with, with this section, but I'm just avoiding having the same fight we had last week. But, which, so I, I, I think this is masking something very difficult in this. If, I screw up the accounting for my factory. I know immediately because of my, my bank account, the effects are uh, pretty instant. If I'm just adding the additional labor value I've done, that's getting passed down the line to the next factory, the next factory, then maybe eventually the Guild of Shoe Workers notices, hey, these shoes are too expensive. And they look back up and back up and back up. It's not immediate. And I think that, that you know, given the complexity of the system, that could be quite difficult. 
we're, I think we're going to get into that. In, 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 we're going to get into this in sure. more detail. So let, let's yeah, put it off for here. That. Yeah. Just a quick post-production point here. But the thing I would like to point out here is that you do not need to wait until you get to the final shoe for the inefficiencies to get picked up. The inefficiencies can get picked up at each intermediary product stage. So the leather, the production of the lace, the tanning, each individual intermediary product. The inefficiencies will be picked up at that point. It's not like the production of a car has to wait until the car is made to inquire about the inefficiencies of rubber production. These things become immediately apparent to the rubber production guilds. That's all I wanted to say here. So anybody want to try uh, progress? Who wants to have a go at reading this next section? C, the progress. From this point of view, the impossible calculation of the work involved in a product appears in a completely different light. What Kautsky cannot do from his economic center, the producers themselves can do very well. The secret is that every operational unit, managed and administered by its operational organization, acts as an independent unit, just as in capitalism. At first sight, one might think that each individual production plant is quite independent. Still, if one looks closer, one will clearly see that the umbilical cord through which the individual plant is connected with the rest of the economy and its management. And that's from Otto Leichner again. Each independent unit has an end product. And by applying the formula, bracketed F plus C plus L, it can calculate at any time how much work is necessary for its product. Finally, when the final plant has finished its final product so that it can be consumed, we know immediately how much work it has involved from the beginning to the final product, including transport and other ancillary activities. Just as production is made up of sub-processes, the calculation of working time is also made up, a calculation that is entirely in the hands of the producers and is therefore not a function of Kautsky's economic headquarters. Kautsky, therefore, recognizes the need to calculate the average social working time of the products, but he does not see any possibility of putting this concept into concrete terms. No wonder that he is not able to comprehend anything, but not even the slightest of the various problems that concern this category. For example, he is already stuck in the diversity of productivity of the operations, in the question of the progress of technology, and in the price of the products. Although it may be superfluous, after we have uncovered his fundamental mistakes, to deal even more closely with his objections, we want to follow up his observations for the concrete version of the category of socially average working time. D. The difference in company productivity. For this purpose, we initially concentrate on the prices of products. He points out that not all companies are equally productive. One company has a better location than another or it has a better organization of production, or there are better machines. In short, the production costs differ slightly in all companies that produce the same product, perhaps even significantly. For example, one shoe factory can produce shoes in 3.125 hours, another in three and a half hours, and another in three hours per pair. Thus, each company gets a different production time, and each company has its own operational average. The social production, however, is about determining the social average, i.e. how much work is invested in a pair of shoes, calculated over the entire social shoe production. It is, therefore, no different from the average of all shoe factories in the district. For example, in the examples we mentioned, it would be possible for the social average to be 3.3 hours per pair. It is, therefore, a remarkable fact. In our example, the social average could be 3.3 hours per pair, while no operation works according to this average. There is a contradiction between the actual labor input in each individual operation, the average of the operation, and the social average. This contradiction will always exist, even if the communist economic life is perfectly organized. Because two operational units will rarely be completely the same, Technological progress alone means that there will always be differences, because if a new type of machine is introduced, it will not be put into operation simultaneously everywhere. 
It is this contradiction that confronts Kautsky with insurmountable difficulties and leads him to claim the impossibility of calculating working hours. He asks, and what work should one calculate? But not the one that really cost every product? The different copies of the same type would have different prices, those produced under less favorable conditions higher than others. But that would be absurd. They would all have to have the same price. And that would have to be calculated, not according to work really spent, but according to the socially necessary work. So Karl Kautsky again, and the proletarian revolution end here program. Kautsky rightly demands here that the prices of the products, we will use its terminology for a moment, must correspond to the socially necessary work. This is not the work that was actually spent on the product in each individual operational unit, because the time actually spent is sometimes above and sometimes below the average. The solution to the problem, however, is once again that the producers themselves, i.e. their accounting department, calculates this social average and not Kautsky. What the leaders of Hilferding's general cartel cannot do, the producers themselves can do very well. Okay, let, let's stop there because uh, it's a quite a long section. So let's break this down. So this is the, the general idea here. He's laying it down before he, he gives it to us exactly in the next section. But our, at the end of this section, he, he, he's going to show us how the guild calculates the price. Does anybody have any comments or will we, will we finish this section? Okay, so what is it all about? It is a matter of determining the average of the entire footwear industry. We can see from this that the demand to determine the socially necessary work leads directly to an accounting link between similar operational units, the horizontal consolidation. In the very first transitional period, it will not go far beyond this accounting consolidation. But over time, the accounting results must lead to mutual technical interpenetration. However, this horizontal merger is not a formation of a cartel carried out by the civil service and in which the producers are excluded from control of the production process, but the merger grows out of the operational units themselves. The how and why is completely clear for every worker, transparent, because firstly, the workers understand very well that they cannot compete against each other, and secondly, they soon learn that planned production is only possible based on the social average. The connection of the individual operational units to industrial branches appears to be, therefore, similar to capitalist cartel formation. Capitalist enterprises, however, join forces to maximize profits. They set prices in such a way that the worst company can still make a profit, giving the well-equipped factories additional profit. However, the communist industrial sector determines the average of all operational units. Together, the operational units have socially average productivity. Precisely because the social average is calculated from all these operational units, the under and over productivities must balance each other out. The downward and upward deviations are therefore always zero. If all operational units, both under and over productive, pass on their products to society according to the social production time, the bookkeeping of the industrial sector must always be balanced. The elimination of the contradiction between the actual work carried out in each individual operational unit and the social average is, therefore, a matter which is resolved within the sector. It is a question of accounting. How these accounts are kept does not fall within the framework of general theoretical considerations, since this processing varies according to the type of operational unit. There are many ways of achieving this. In principle, however, it is the following. Footwear sector. Plant number one produces 40,000 pairs of shoes in 3.125 hours, which is 125,000 hours. Plant number two produces 65,000 pairs of shoes in 3.5 hours, which is 227,500 hours. Plant number three produces 100,000 pairs of shoes in three hours, which is 300,000 hours. The entire industry produces 205,000 pairs of shoes in 652,500 hours. That is per pair, 652,500 divided by 205,000 equaling 3.18 hours. 
the operational averages are 3.125, 3.5, and 3 hours. The social average is 3.18 hours. Plant 1 has a production time that is below the social average and thus shows above average productivity. Company number 3 as well. Plant number 2 works more time consuming than the social average and is therefore below average production. If the shoes are charged with 3.18 hours in consumption, then the operational units one and three have hours over in the accounting, which correspond to the deficit in the accounts of unit two. Okay, so there we have it. After all this shit talking, Leiter and Kautsky, we have this way by which prices can be calculated, and this is calculating them at the guild level. Now, here he's using shoes, you know, as a kind of generic. I think in capitalism, you would have probably a calculation based on SKUs, you know, much more. I mean, in in, a few, in actual operation of communism, you'd have it on a SKU level, which is like, you know, a, a code for a very more, more precise than uh, just a shoe. It would be like a particular type of shoe or whatever. But this is it. We have the social average. So we have the three plants producing shoes, uh, some below average, some some uh, above average productivity. But uh, the deficits that correspond to the unproductive units versus the productive units, that balances out over the sector. So the price will mean that individual firms will not be able to reproduce themselves, but the sector will be able to re- reproduce themselves. And the sector will will get the funds and distribute them the way they need to ensure reproduction for each individual unit. I think this is is an entirely elegant solution to the problem that mirrors, like it's a very mirror version of what happens under capitalism, that uh, you have the socially necessary labor time. And here we have the, you know, the social average, which gives us our price. And then instead of individual firms going bust, what we have is a horizontal, what's the description he calls it? A horizontal merger grows out of the operational units themselves. So like the shoe guild, and they will deal with how to increase productivity as a guild will themselves decide what is the best use of a replacing our fixed capital to get these different things up to similar levels of productivity. So there's not a profit and loss motivation for the firms. There is an increasing in productivity motivation, and it's through the guild itself. Okay, anybody have any comments on this most important equation that we kind of get to in in the book, probably after the uh, the F and the C and the L? Any comments? Kielcha. Yeah, I just want to talk about um, when it says, you know, effectively you you set up this system and you're, basically producing um, the same way that uh, capitalist cartels do. Um, and, and that worries me a bit because I've always understood capitalist cartels not to be a particularly efficient sort of thing to aim for. They seem to work quite well in sort of stagnant or very sort of stag- a very, very, very unchanging sort of markets, but they don't seem to respond very well to change. And so that, that, that seems to suggest that we're, we're setting ourselves up for the same sorts of problems. I don't think he ever uses the word cartel for them. I think he kind of says they're not a cartel. You know, this horizontal merger is not a formation of a cartel carried out by the civil service, but the merger grows out of the operational units themselves. Like, I I think, uh, you know, the cartel is usually a way of increasing your profit. You know, that if you have an agreement with all producers to set a price, Look at the next paragraph. That's the relevant one. The connection okay. of the individual operational units to industrial branches appears to be therefore similar to capitalist cartel formation. Okay. Capitalist enterprises, however, join force to maximize profits, such that the worst company can still make a profit, giving the well-equipped factories an additional profit. However, the communist industrial sector determines the average of all operational units. So there won't be any benefit to an individual unit by being more productive than the other. They don't accrue a profit so fundamentally like the the form may be similar but the essence the content is is different take our example here that we deal with in this one we have the most efficient one here is number three okay number three doesn't accrue a profit to themselves what happens is that all of them as a sector reproduces itself and the what's needed to reproduce themselves is then given to each individual firm from the guild Macaroni has a comment. 
Yeah, so something that I think about a lot when I'm reading through this section is like the one one potential weakness or potential thing that I like you could be afraid of, I think, is in this kind of a system, it is where where the the average hour is determined to be, you know, based off of like an or or the, the socially necessary to hour is determined based off of averages. Like in a in a more alienated system, like under capitalism, like there is an incentive in that kind of a system to like produce slow. So like I know in in a lot of places where you know pay is based off of incentives or pay is based off of quotas or things like that, there's like an incentive to like not be as efficient or as productive as you can be because you know if you're too too efficient, then you raise the the quota level for everyone. But what I think is the real power of this system is because everything is transparent and because everything is being represented in these same hours, you can look at this and be like, hey, plant two, what the hell are you doing? You know, why is it that you're, you know, you're producing so inefficiently compared to everyone else? What, you know, either what can we do to help out with this or, you know, what, what is it, what is it that needs to change here in order to get you up to, up to speed with everyone else. I think that this, like the, the real benefit of this kind of system is by making everything so obvious in terms of like the inputs and outputs, it provides a check on potentially, I don't know what the right word would be. Bad faith is like not the right word, but like um, on, on potentially uh, like, like attempting to, to game the system or attempting to like you know, work, work slowly to, you know, reduce the, or, or inefficiencies or things like that. I don't know. It's the, no, it's, 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 yeah, just misreporting your L, you know, just saying we worked, you know, 40 hours a week when you only work 25, you know, something as simple as that, you know. Like, and I think what we will have, because it's also open, you will have historical data from each plant as well. So if you've got factory A with the same machines and everything, and suddenly their productivity goes down 15% in the, over, like, you know, obviously there can be issues in the short term, but say over a long term, you see vast differences emerges between like historically what they were doing and currently what they're doing. You know, society as a whole would be able to see that and they can inquire. And, and also the guild will be able to see that. And the, the guild will act as a function. Because like if you think about it, one way in which the guild itself kind of will be able to control this is uh, been doing some work. Donald, who was on a lot of the calls previously, he's not here today, but we've been kind of working out some of the detail here. Donald was kind of coming up with this concept of like, how would you how would you decide how many uh, shoes each factory gets to produce? So you'd want to give out like more shoes to the more productive one and less shoes to the to the to the least productive one, all all the way so that the amount of labor is uh, divided equally amongst all the workers. So, you know, in, in a case where you have an inefficient factory who, who then brings in a new machine, okay, so is able to increase their productivity, that would mean that the amount of the shoes that their quota is will, will raise up. And it would mean that the other, the other plants, say plant one and three, they, what they have to produce goes down. So plant one and three have a real, like they have to do less work the more plant two becomes efficient. So the, the, the three of them as a guild will actually tend to condition each other. So I think it's very, very simple and very powerful. I think, I think the guild is a, is a very good way for, to monitor the system. But also then externally, people can monitor the guild itself, you know, in case the guild is allowing all of them to misreport their L's. So like uh, the mental labor that's going in, that is also something that should be very simple because all of these information stuff is open to society and we have agreed plans and you know factories have to justify why they can't meet a plan and if they're not doing this they're the workers are not actually pulling their their wage society i think has the right to either bring in new workers you know take control of the plan for themselves you know we're all a part of society we all have to pull our weight okay kilcha do you want to just take the last page then e the progress of technology but Kautsky has even more arrows in his quiver to prove the impossibility of the working time calculation. After showing what a gigantic work it would be to calculate the amount of work from start to finish, he says, and if you were finished, you would have to start all over again, since the technical conditions in some industries have changed in the meantime. Yes, it's sad. After Kautsky has closely observed all sub-processes from his high vantage point, where the wires of production converge, he, he calculates 
how much working time is finally contained in the social end product. That is then, thank God, ready. But then the devilish technology comes and throws all his calculations over the top again. But we have to hurry to calm Kautsky down. The amount of work the product needs after it has gone through all the sub-processes does not suddenly appear under the convulsive writing of his pencil. But the producers determine the working time for each sub-process. As technology advances or other productivity increases, the socially average working time for this sub-process decreases. If the product in question is coincidentally the end product for individual consumption, then it is transferred to consumption with a reduced average, and that is the end. However, if it is to be passed on to another company as F or C, as a means of production or as a raw material, the costs for this other operational unit are reduced so that it can also work cheaper. In this way, the shortening of the social production time in a sector spreads to the entire economy without disturbing the calculations of others. Kautsky's objections to the working time calculation all result from his crazy view of social production. He is stuck in the general cartel and therefore speaks of socially necessary work, but sees no possibility to give this term a concrete form. This is no wonder. It only takes on its concrete form through the management and administration of production in the hands of the producers by the association of free and equal producers. From the practice of the revolutionary class struggle, which created the council system, the concrete version of the socially necessary working time was born at the same time. Okay, so any kind of final comments on all of this stuff or this last section even? Are you just giving it to Kautsky again? <laughs> I, we're getting towards the end of shitting on, on Kowski and these people for a while. I, I think this is just shows, I think it's a very, very simple mirror form to capitalism where we have individual factories working and recording their own stuff like under capitalism. But instead of the profit and loss motive driving certain businesses into the dust and making people unemployed, we have a, at a guild level, we have got controlling how to increase productivity so that nobody is thrown onto the street. It's a fundamentally different essence to the form of the individual operational unit. So much like we made earlier, the comment Marx was making about how the workers have to, under capitalism, reproduce themselves individually and under communism, it is social reproduction. Here we're seeing the equivalent for the firm we're seeing the individual factory reproducing itself under capitalism individually, but here we're seeing it reproduce itself socially. So as in the guild itself controls it, and the guild is the level at which reproduction of the individual factories is managed, uh, which is a fundamental change. So we won't see, we don't see factories going out of business because they're not making a loss. We don't see this destruction of fixed capital uh, happening in this manner that happens under capitalism all the time. We do not have a profit and loss crisis, endogenous crisis in this system that is being excised out of the system. So we, we see entirely different dynamics we see a different dynamic for controlling productivity than what is under capitalism. It's similar but different to do with increasing production and also to uh, reduce labor hours according to a plan. So I think we, we, we kind of got the basic look at the fundamental rules here. This The previous chapter showed us the overall societal-wide idea, and this is showing us the individual mechanisms by which we price a shoe with multiple factories. So we've gone from the, what did he call it in chapter seven, kind of societal level communist reproduction, and here we're breaking it down into the individual factory level and how that operates. Next week, we'll try chapter nine, and we're motoring like we are officially halfway through the book now. I'll see you all next week.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.